Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends, welcome to the Nordic House. On a very happy occasion, when we're celebrating the publication of an academic book, the one I'm sure you've all already seen outside the door. I'd also like to mention before I say anything else that it's actually very well priced here today. So you can check that out afterwards. For the next two hours, we are here to discuss a brand new book, Small States and Shelter Theory, Iceland's External Affairs. A fresh approach to explaining small state behavior. The book presents a new small state theory on the behavior of small states in the international system. And it, ex it examines Iceland's external affairs from 1940 to the present. It is the outcome of an extensive research project on Iceland's political, economic, and societal relations with its larger neighboring states and international organizations. My name is Pia Hansson. I'm director of the Center for Small State Studies that belongs to the Institute of International Affairs at the University of Iceland, and I will be your moderator here today. Uh, let me also tell you a little bit about the research that this book is founded on. The research was conducted under the leadership of Professor Balte Thoraldsson at the Faculty of Political Science at the University of Iceland and a team of scholars at the Center for Small State Studies. Let me also remind you that Baldur has quite a few titles. That's uh, very much the Icelandic way of doing things. He is a Sean Monet Chair of European Studies, but he is also a Professor of Political Science, and he is the Research Director of the Center for Small State Studies. I also want to say the reason why we're doing this in English. For one thing, the book is actually written in English, so it makes sense to have the whole uh, seminar in English. But it's also because we have, of course, a large group of international students here. Uh, they are participating in a discipline of small state uh, studies at the University of Iceland. So, of course, it makes sense for all of us to be able to understand each other. The aim of this seminar is to answer the question, which states and international organizations have provided Iceland with political, economic, and societal shelter in the past? And which world actors will provide Iceland with shelter in the near future? The authors will start by answering the first half of this question, and then we intend to answer the latter half of the question in the panel discussions. And we have a distinguished panel here for you today. We will have the Minister of Education and Culture. We will have the Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Parliament participating. We will have the Director of the Icelandic Coast Guard participating. And for the closing remarks, we're actually going to have the Prime Minister of Iceland, Katrin Jakobsdóttir, talking. So you're in for a good two hours. But now on to the presentations. Baltur will start and give us an introduction and a brief overview of the theory of shelter. Then the authors will present their findings regarding uh, Iceland's relations with the United States and the Nordic states. And then Iceland will come, uh, Balde will come back and talk about Iceland's participation in the European project. So join me now in welcoming Balder Thoraldsson to the podium. Uh, chair, distinguished guests, first of all, I would like to thank all of you for coming. Uh, great to see so many of uh, you here. I would also like to use the opportunity to thank all of those who have contributed to the book and provided valuable comments to the theory and our cases, which we placed within the theoretical framework. So thanks to all of you. Uh, the theory of shelter was born few days after the 2008 economic crash here in Iceland. During the boom years, I received several requests to explain how Iceland's smallness contributed to the economic boom and the associated Icelandic outvasion. But I always failed to provide an explanation. I always had difficulties in understanding this connection 
since it contradicted the traditional small state literature. While there were certain opportunities associated with Iceland's smallness, the country also faced severe challenges related to its size. Policymakers had to compensate for these in order for the country to prosper in the long run. In early October 2008, the puzzle was solved by the Icelandic financial crash. Iceland became the first small country of many to be hard hit by the international economic crisis. The theory of shelter has been developing ever since and we have, placed a num and we have published a number of academic papers on Iceland within the shelter framework. Nowadays, scholars have also used the theory to understand the international relations of several small states and ent entities around the globe, including uh, Ireland, Singapore, Cuba, Armenia, Ar Armenia, and all the Nordic and Baltic nations. This book seeks to develop shelter theory and use it to make a comprehensive analysis of Iceland's external affairs from the British and American occupations of Iceland at the beginning of the Second World War up to the present. The aim is to shed a light on the importance of external affairs in Iceland's history, often neglected in the present literature, and to start a debate on Iceland's placement on a political, economic, and societal map of states. Small states are a very diverse group. Several of them are among the most prosperous states on the planet, whereas others are among the most fragile. While members of this diverse group of states presently face different challenges, all of them have to compensate for size-related difficulties or size-related problems. They have, as we see it, inherent structural vulnerabilities related to the smallest, such as a small domestic market, limited defense capacity, limited human capital, and a small public administration, including a small foreign service. The more successful small states, such as the Nordic states, the Benelux states, Austria and Switzerland have developed certain domestic features such as democratic corporatism, a comprehensive welfare state and uh, a decisive uh, public uh, administration in order to cope with their smallness. Accordingly, we can say that small states can buffer from within. However, there are limits to what a small state can do on its own. A small state also needs an external protector, a state or an international organization to provide it with shelter. And this book is about the external dimension of inherent size-related difficulties in states. The importance of shelter is related to three interrelated features. The reduction of risk in the face of a possible crisis event. Help in absorbing shocks during a crisis situation. And assistance in dealing with the aftermath of the crisis. We argue that small states need external shelter in order to survive and prosper. They are dependent on economic, political, and societal shelter provided by large state as well as regional and international organizations. Political shelter takes the shape of direct and visible 
diplomatic or military assistance provided by another, another state or an international organization and organizational rules and norms in the international system. Economic shelter can include direct economic assistance, a currency union, union, a help from an external financial authority, beneficial loans, favorable market access, and a common market. All of it, again, provided by a more powerful country or an international organization. Societal shelter can contain the diffusion of foreign people and ideas in order to avoid social stagnation and to make up for a lack of indigenous knowledge. We argue that cultural transaction with the outside world in terms of transfer of messages, norms, values, and lifestyles are essential for the prosperity of a small community. The traditional international relations and small state literature often neglect the importance of societal relations. It is through constant interaction with other cultures and ideas that a society evolves and moves forward. That all said, protection often comes at a certain cost. And to be clear, we are not suggesting that the relations between small and large entities are always beneficial for the smaller entity. And it's certainly not true that the large estates always act out of some kind of compassion. For instance, in 1967, the scholar David Vital argued, and I quote, where the quest for protection and insurance is successful, a price must normally be paid in terms of sacrifice of autonomy in the control of national resources and loss of freedom of political maneuver and choice. I unquote. We define shelter as composed of those external relations which are favorable to our small entity. However, we also identify the external relations which have or which were harmful to Icelanders over the years. The validity of the theory depends on the proportion of benefits to costs. Let's now move to our first case, the Icelandic-American relations. Thank you. Okay, so in our study we find that Iceland gained substantial political and economic shelter from the United States. Iceland also gained some societal shelter from the United States, but this societal shelter paled in comparison to the extensive military, diplomatic, and economic assistance that Iceland received. Uh, the period 1941 to 2006 can rightly be called the American period uh, in the history of Iceland's external relations. Uh, as the U.S. had a substantial impact on Iceland's politics, uh, economy, and culture. So, in 1940, Iceland was invaded and occupied by the United Kingdom. Uh, while the invasion illustrates the vulnerability that small states face, Iceland was quick to adapt to the situation and sought to get shelter from the occupying power. So the Icelanders cooperated with the British in exchange for favorable trade terms, uh, assurances of non-interference in domestic affairs, and a promise of immediate withdrawal at the end of the war. Iceland accepted the US takeover of the occupation in 1941 with the same promises, but now also with promises from the US and the UK uh, that the two states would uh, recognize Iceland's independence and sovereignty and exercise their best efforts to make sure that the post-war settlement uh, recognized Iceland as an independent state. Throughout the Second World War, uh, Iceland maintained a formal policy of neutrality 
uh, in the wars, in the, in the years immediately after World War II, uh, Icelandic elites still believed that neutrality was a credible way to ensure Iceland's security. Uh, and this was because the international system did not seem to be uh, particularly unstable after World War II, and, uh, the U and the Soviet Union did not seem to be a significant threat or immediate threat to a non-aligned Iceland. Uh, and there was also a common perspective in Iceland that the US would come to Iceland's rescue e in case of attack, even if there was no formal agreement specifying that obligation. Uh, so Icelandic elites believed that they had informal security guarantees that they could rely on. Uh, illustrating the vol volatility that small states face, there were global crises that made Iceland rethink uh, how it organized its security. So in 1948, there was a coup d'etat in Czechoslovakia that made the Soviet Union seem a greater threat, that made the international system seem more unstable. Uh, this, coupled with the failure to create a Scandinavian defense union, uh, motivated the Icelanders to pursue NATO membership in 1941. So NATO membership uh, meant that Iceland got formal assurances that it would be defended in case of attack. The outbreak of the Korean War in 1950 uh, changed security calculations again, uh, as Icelandic elites believed that simply being a member of NATO was not sufficient military shelter. Uh, Iceland needed a military presence in Iceland, and thus uh, sought a full basing agreement with the US, a defense treaty where the US uh, was allowed to set up uh, a base in Iceland. So through NATO membership and a defense treaty with the US, Iceland achieved formal assurances that it would get defended in case of attack, and it also had a military presence in Iceland, uh, which would deter an attack. Uh, the US also provided Iceland with extensive diplomatic backing as the US negotiated favorable trade agreements for Iceland uh, and helped Iceland within international organizations. So in the post World War II years, there was a proliferation of international organizations, international law, and norms that proved you know, beneficial to small states, but which came with costs and obligations. Uh, within organizations such as the OEC, the World Bank, and the IMF, Iceland received access to loans, uh, technical assistance, and economic advice, but Iceland flouted the rules of these organizations. Uh, and these violations were tolerated because the U.S. advocated on Iceland's behalf within these organizations. Uh, Iceland's strategic importance to the U.S. also gave Iceland the leverage to win the Cod Wars. So the Cod Wars were a set of militarized interstate disputes between Iceland and the United Kingdom over Iceland's extensions of fishing zones and territorial waters. So what is striking about these extensions is that they were unilateral. They compromised the interests of several great European powers, such as the UK, West Germany. Uh, Iceland was left vulnerable to economic coercion uh, in the form of sanctions or even the use of military, military force. And these extensions were also opposed in principle by Iceland's fellow NATO members. Despite all of this, Iceland won the Cod Wars. And Iceland won these disputes in large part due to assistance from the US and NATO. Uh, and this assistance ranged from direct intervention, such as when uh, the US helped Iceland to sell fish, when the British put sanctions on Icelandic fish, uh, and also to pressure on the UK behind the scenes to settle with the Icelanders. Uh, Iceland's strategic importance and the fact that the Icelanders were threatening to leave NATO and or close the military base in Iceland, facilitated what Henry Kissinger referred to as the tyranny of the weak, uh, thus ensuring that NATO and the US sought to appease Iceland. However, the departure of the US military in 2006 uh, sort of demonstrates uh, that Iceland no longer receives as comprehensive military shelter as it used to during the Cold War, and that it could not rely on uh, the extensive diplomatic backing that it used to receive. Uh, so in the book, we look at uh, the economic shelter that Iceland received from the US, and we divide this into different periods. So the period 40 to 48, 48 to 60, 60 to 2006, 
and then we look at the global uh, we look at the 2008 financial crisis at uh, great length. So at the start of the period under study, Iceland is one of Europe's poorest countries, and Iceland is fearful about its ability to, sust to sustain itself during the course of the Second World War. But uh, British and American occupations proved to be an economic blessing for Iceland as the occupiers injected money into the Icelandic economy. And by the end of the war, Iceland was left as one of uh, the world's wealthiest nations. The period 48 to 60 is one of major economic dependence on the US. So the Icelanders tanked their economy in the years immediately following World War II and requested aid from the US. So the Icelanders received uh, uh, a large martial aid package. It was the largest of any recipient. It was almost twice as large per capita as the second highest recipient nation. And what's notable is that Iceland was not destroyed during the course of the Second World War, uh, but still got such a significant martial aid package. And without the martial aid, there would have been a rationing and import quotas in Iceland. There would have been an absence of investments to renew the trawler fleet, to construct hydropower stations. Uh, during the late 1950s, uh, Iceland received what almost amounted to a second martial aid package as the U.S. sought to promote economic stability in Iceland and reduce Soviet influence. Direct economic assistance began to subside after 1960, with some exceptions. However, the U.S. still remained deeply involved in the provision of economic shelter to Iceland as the U.S. paid for Iceland's defense, uh, built and maintained the international airport at Keplavik, uh, maintained an air surveillance system, uh, built and maintained other infrastructure in Iceland. The US base at Keflavik also provided a substantial portion of Iceland's GDP and export earnings, uh, employed a large number of Icelanders, directly and indirectly, and helped sustain the local economies surrounding the base. Uh, but the failure of the U.S. to come to Iceland's rescue during the 2008 financial crisis demonstrates that Iceland could no longer expect to get the kind of comprehensive economic shelter that it received repeatedly during the course of the Cold War. In terms of societal shelter, Iceland's deep relations with the U.S. transformed social structures in Iceland. So the occupiers effectively ended unemployment in Iceland, they paid higher salaries and provided better working conditions than was previously known here. The bargaining position of labor changed. The living conditions of Icelanders improved. Traditional gender roles were altered as women entered the workforce to make up for the labor shortage that the occupiers brought. American TV and radio led to reverberations in Icelandic society, spreading American culture, uh, pressuring the Icelanders to create their own TV channel. But U.S. shelter was not without its cost, as the close ties with the U.S. caused substantial divisions in Icelandic society. There were concerns that the sovereignty of Iceland was being violated, that the culture of Iceland was being undermined. At the very least, Iceland's Western alignment proved to be the most divisive issue in Icelandic politics during the Cold War. The Americans contested for the hearts and minds of Icelanders, as prominent Icelanders were invited on trips to the US, as students were given scholarships to study at American universities. Nearly 900 Fulbright grants were awarded to Icelanders over a 55-year period. Almost 600 Icelanders were invited on trips to the US, including prominent, so including future prime ministers, such as Thorsted Paulsson, David Oddsson, and Geir Harte and future uh, president, Christian Altiot. And intriguingly, sources in the US Embassy uh, have said that one third of the Icelandic parliamentarians elected in 2007 were alumni of these American programs. However, as this graph shows or indicates, even though American shelter was, societal shelter was meaningful, uh, it still paled in comparison to the uh, societal shelter provided by Iceland's uh, neighboring Nordic countries. 
And this is something that Thost that will, will elaborate on. Now, Chair and distinguished guests, uh, my talk, my task here today is to discuss Iceland's relations with the other Nordic countries and whether Iceland has enjoyed political, economic, and societal shelter from these relations. Now, as Sverre covered in the previous talk, Iceland's main political shelter during the second half of the 20th century came from the United States. However, throughout this period, we have found that Iceland also enjoyed important elements of political shelter from the other Nordic countries. An important element here is the various forms of diplomatic support that Iceland enjoyed from the other Nordic countries, especially within international bodies and institutions such as the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank, to name a few. An important venue in this regard is the Nordic Council, where the Nordic states often coordinate uh, the positions and actions that they sub subsequently pursue in large and international organizations. By being part of this group, Iceland has often been able to draw on the coordinated support of the other Nordic states on issues that concern Iceland's core interests. Furthermore, by being part of the Northern Bloc, Iceland can have a seat at the table at institutions such as the World Bank, where the Nordic countries and now the Baltics take turns representing the group. However, the political support of the Nordic countries is not universal or without conditions. This is especially the case when Iceland's position clashes with the interests of other states that the Nordic countries have a close relationship with, such as Britain and the Netherlands during the ISAFE dispute. Nevertheless, overall we have found that the Nordic countries are generally supportive of Iceland in international affairs, and that this support constitutes an important part of our political shelter. Another type of support that Iceland uh, enjoys from the other Nordic countries, and this is a factor that is often underestimated in our opinion, is that I Iceland is often able to draw on the knowledge and expertise of the other Nordic states when it comes to international institutions and agreements. In those cases where Iceland is too small to build su sufficient administrative capacity and expertise on its own. In order to illustrate this, the figure you see here compares the number of people working in foreign embassies and missions abroad for each of the Nordic states. Now, given the small size of Iceland's population and consequently the relatively small size of Iceland's administration, it would simply be impossible for Iceland to build up and maintain the same level of knowledge and expertise on international issues as the Nordic countries. Hence, in order to alleviate this weakness, Iceland has often been able to draw on the knowledge and expertise of the other Nordic countries when navigating the complexities of international institutions and agreements. An important example of this is Iceland's partial participation in European integration through EFTA and the EEA agreement, where Iceland has relied extensively on expertise and even administrative assistance, especially from Norway. The EEA agreement is a good example of how Iceland has long used the Nordic countries as a sort of bridgeway into the rest of Europe. Indeed, we have found that it's not useful to view Iceland's relations with the Nordic countries on the one hand and the rest of Europe on the other as different priorities in Iceland's external relations. Instead, we have found that Iceland has more often than not managed to leverage its position as part of the Nordic world to gain better access and agreements to the rest of Europe than we otherwise would presumably have been able to do. This is true of our participation in EFTA and the EEA agreement, but more recently also with our participation in Schengen. In this respect, it is also worth pointing out that there is essentially a membership fee that the EEA countries have to pay to be part of the European market. From the beginning, Norway has always paid the vast majority of this fee and can thus, in effect, be said to bankroll Iceland's access to the European market. Furthermore, we also argue that Iceland enjoys important political shelter from the Nordic countries through cooperation on various soft security issues, such as collaboration on cybersecurity, as well as search and rescue missions. An important factor in this regard is the Icelandic Coast Guard's close cooperation with its, with its counterparts in Denmark and Norway. It has been noted that Iceland has moved closer to the Nordic countries on security matters since the US military left in 2006, ado adopting a more similar language and approaches to security. 
Indeed, the security shelter that Iceland enjoys from the other Nordic countries has arguably increased in the last decade, especially considering the recent joint statements where the Nordic countries commit to coming to each other's mutual defense in, in all non-military um, emergencies. So our finding is that Iceland has and continues to enjoy various forms of political shelter from the other Nordic countries, and in some ways the importance of that shelter is increasing. However, considering the relatively small size of the Nordic region as a whole, the Nordic countries are unable to provide Iceland with comprehensive security shelter on their own and are unlikely to do so in the near future. Now moving on to the economic part, we found that Iceland enjoyed some elements of economic shelter from the Nordic countries, but that this shelter was both conditional and incomplete due to the relatively small size of the Nordic economies. The Nordic countries are simply too small to rely on each other economically and have therefore needed to look towards larger European states and towards European integration more generally. However, an important element of economic shelter that Iceland has enjoyed from the Nordic states is the ability of Icelanders to live and work in the other Nordic countries for shorter and longer periods. This was particularly important in the 1960s as well as in the aftermath of the 2008 economic crisis when large numbers of Icelanders emigrated to the Nordic countries, especially to Norway, for work. This eased the pressure on the Icelandic labor market, which would otherwise have had to deal with significantly higher numbers of unemployment, and thereby also alleviated pressure on the state's central budget. The easy access that Icelanders have to the labor markets of the other Nordic countries therefore serves as an important buffer for the Icelandic economy during economic downturns. Today, of course, Icelanders are free to move and take up employment anywhere within the European economic area. Nevertheless, the vast majority um, still decides to move uh, to the Nordic countries. And if we look at the whole period from 1971 to 2011, three out of every four Icelanders emigrating abroad went to Denmark, Norway, or Sweden. On this figure, we can see um, the composition of Icelanders living abroad in year 2017. As you can see today, the main destination for Icelanders abroad is still the Nordic countries. And this brings us to the third, and in our opinion, perhaps the most important part of Iceland's relations with the Nordic world, that is the societal shelter that Iceland enjoys from the Nordic countries. Now, there are many ways in which Icelandic society has been closely interwoven uh, with the societies of the other Nordic countries throughout the second half of the 20th century and are still today, and it would be impossible to address all of them here. However, there are three aspects of societal shelter that I want to address. Firstly, the, United, the Nordic states decided early on through cooperation in the Nordic Council uh, to give citizens of other Nordic countries access to their own welfare systems on an equal footing with their own citizens. This has been extremely important for the large numbers of Icelanders moving, emigrating to the Nordic countries. And the generous access that Icelanders have long enjoyed to the welfare system of other Nordic states has allowed them to seek education and work in those countries, while at the same time bringing their families or start families in those countries. Secondly, the Nordic countries have served as an important role model for Iceland in terms of legislation, the building of state institutions, and the welfare states more generally. It has often been pointed out that the Nordic countries have converged towards a fairly similar welfare state model, the so-called Nordic model. The reason for this is that policymakers and experts in the Nordic bureaucracies have long had an extensive collaboration with each other where they share experiences, best practices, and learn from each other's mistakes and imitate each other's institutions. Iceland inevitably had a much smaller administration and was therefore unable to provide the same level of knowledge and expertise to build up the complex institutions of a, Nord of a modern state. These Nordic spheres of collaboration thus became important venues for Icelandic policymakers and bureaucrats where they could learn from the other Nordic countries and imitate many of their laws and institutions. And still today, we can see that reforms on Icelandic legislation concerning women's rights, gay rights, and prostitution, to take a few examples, are directly influenced by developments in the other Nordic states. Now, the third point I want to make, and perhaps the most important one, is about the extensive access that Icelanders have enjoyed to universities in other Nordic countries. <clears throat> 
Throughout the second half of the 20th century, the Nordic, Nordic countries have been by far the most important destinations for Icelanders seeking higher education abroad, as you can see from this figure here that Sverre showed you before. In fact, for most of this period, around half of Icelanders studying abroad have been in the Nordic countries, except for a considerable dip around the 1990s. It is in interesting to see that in the new millennium, the proportion of Icelandic students going to the Nordic countries has sharply increased again, suggesting that the Nordic connection is by no means fading away. When it comes to higher education, it is worth pointing out that it would be impossible to maintain high levels of development and prosperity in a modern society without specialized knowledge and training in various fields ranging from medicine and engineering to aviation and agriculture, to take a few examples. And small societies like Iceland are very far from being able to produce and maintain such a knowledge base on their own. It is therefore essential for small states that their citizens are able to seek such knowledge abroad. We in Iceland often take this for granted, but it is by no means self-evident that a small society like Iceland would have such open and generous access to world-class universities in other countries. And if we look around the world, we can easily find many examples of small societies that don't enjoy such access, which has hindered their level of development and prosperity. Now lastly, given that this, book, this is a book on international relations theory, some of you might ask, what do any of these societal issues have to do with the theory of international relations? International relations theories usually deal first and foremost with high politics and security matters, and to some extent with the economic aspects of, of world politics. Why would we be talking about education and welfare systems in a book on world politics? Now, the answer to that is one of the main theoretical arguments that we advance in this book, namely that for small societies to prosper and thrive in world politics, they need not only political and economic shelter, but also societal shelter. And by that, we mean that the well-being of a small state depends on the extent to which it has access to the societal resources of larger states and on the terms on which that access is granted. And it is our finding that from the founding of the Icelandic Republic, Iceland has enjoyed wide-ranging and privileged access to other Nordic societies, and that this access has been and continues to be an essential source of Iceland's well-being. Thank you. And now Baldur. Let's now uh, turn to Iceland's membership of EFTA, the EEA, and Schengen. And the main findings. First, Iceland's participation in the European project provides a more complicated reading in terms of our shelter theory than our previous cases, as I will come back to at the end of my presentation. Second, membership of EFTA has provided important economic shelter. EFTA membership paved the way for a beneficial free trade agreement with the European Economic Community, was an important part of the economic modernization of the government at the time, and contributed to the economic growth in the country. It is also, also worth mentioning that EFTA has made free trade agreements on behalf of its members with 38 countries and provides Iceland with an essential support in the running of the EEA agreement. Third, membership of the European Economic Area provides important economic shelter. Iceland joined the EEA in order to gain better access to its most important market, and the EEA membership is regarded as highly economically beneficial. Four, EEA membership has turned out to have much wider reaching societal shelter implications than previously thought, as I will come back to in just a moment. Five, Membership of Schengen has provided more important political shelter than anticipated at first. 
Membership in Schengen was approved due to the importance of keeping the Nordic passport union in place and has provided important soft security shelter due to the importance of police collaboration. Six, Iceland has sought shelter by the European Union by aligning itself with its foreign policy, a fact which is not often spoken about here in Iceland and, and rarely not known. Iceland's adherence to the EU's foreign policy declarations is regulated through statements on political dialogue made by governments of the EU and the EFTA countries in connection with the signing of the EEA agreement. The alignment serves the same purpose as Iceland's alignment with the US foreign policy. It is intended to show solidarity with other Western countries, a united front, in order to strengthen relationship between the parties and get their support in case of minor or major crisis situation in Iceland. I'm, I'm sorry to say that I will not be able to cover all these points. I've, I have decided to focus on the societal shelter aspect of our membership of the European Economic Area. In 1992, the Althingi narrowly approved the EEA agreement and vocal demands were made for a referendum on the agreement. The sentiment was so strong that the president, Vigdís Finnbogadóttir, even considered refusing to sign the act ratifying the agreement, a step which a president of Iceland had never taken before. In the end, Vigdís approved the agreement and claims that she signed it in order for the Icelandic youth to gain access to the educational programs that are stimulated in the agreement, to move Iceland closer to Europe, to limit American influence, and to act in accordance with the traditional non-political role of the presidential office. The president's actions demonstrate one of the most important features of societal shelter, the transfer of norms, values, and more generally messages to small peripheral communities. And I want to mention three of our cases that we cover in the chapter on Europe in the book. So to the first case. Iceland has been transformed by EEA legislation in several policy fields. A adoption of this law have basically modernized the society and, and brought it into line with our neighbors. In fact, the EEA, EEA membership has led to radical legislative changes in Iceland, especially in areas of competition law and environmental law. Shelter implication may be greater in a small market, a small community, which has small policy-making networks, networks and limited competition rather than in bigger markets or bigger communities with different competing actors. Second, one of the most important elements of the EEA agreement has been the access it gives Icelanders to in institutions of higher education within the EU, and the EU's educational opportunities, research and funds which support innovation. This access underscores our findings that Iceland gains extensive societal shelter from membership in the EEA in terms of research, education, and innovation. Through the EU grant programs, Iceland has received approximately two euros from these programs from every euro that it has allocated to the programs for the period 1995 to 2016. In general, the smaller EU EEA member states benefit disproportionately 
from the EU educational funds as com comp compared with the larger states, which is due to the smallness and the rules which grant each state a minimum amount within particular grant schemes. Within the Erasmus Plus program in the period 2014 to 16, Iceland was by far the highest receiving recipient per person. In 2017, the European Commission estimated that 28,710 Icelanders have directly benefited from the Erasmus program in the period from 1992 to 2017. Icelanders collaborate most often with researchers from the large EU member states and the three Scandinavian states. These networks and encounters with foreigners indicate from our point of view how Icelanders are affected by the external world. By working closely with foreigners and establishing networks, Icelanders become more likely to innovate and make creative contributions. While it's hard to quantify these effects, these interactions have contributed to the growth of science and arts in Iceland over the last few decades, have helped to boost the output of Icelandic firms and research institutions, and have strengthened the country's competitiveness. Third, Another important element of shelter theory is the movement of people both to and from the small state. The free movement of people within the EEA has not only provided Icelanders with important opportunities abroad, but it has also served as an important economic tool during the country's economic burst and booms. And I've got one figure. This one, which indicates that both immigration and emigration are closely associated with the state of the economy. It also shows that EEA membership has made the labor market very flexible. Several studies suggest that migrants lead to greater invention and innovation within the receiving societies greater trade in good, goods and services, and greater educational achievements among the natives. So we conclude that the, that the EEA cannot simply be written off as a purely economic body. Instead, it has to be understood as having wide-reaching societal implications. Back to this one. That all said, there are always costs associated with seeking shelter. And EEA membership has turned out to have costly, costly implications. Our chapter identifies five main costs. I'm just going to briefly mention them. First, the Icelandic government fail to take notice of the consequences that a free flow of capital would have on the small Icelandic market. This contributed to the economic collapse in 2008. Second, Iceland has to implement EEA rules without any real option to wait in on them. The binding effects of societal shelter that are associated with the EEA membership require pooling of sovereignty and assets. In general, small states are often under pressure to adopt transnational regulations. The danger is that small states may have limited influence on the regulations which they are bound to implement, and they could feel pressure to follow the policies of the shelter provider. The EFTA EEA states are a prime example of this. Third, membership in the EEA gives a sense of false shelter 
at times of crisis. Iceland sought support from the European Central Bank at the height of and after its economic crash. However, this plea was rejected. Moreover, the EU rejected support requests by Iceland and chose to support Britain and the Netherlands in the ICEF dispute, as all of us remember. Accordingly, membership in the EEA provides neither political shelter in terms of diplomatic assistance, nor economic shelter in terms of external assistance before, during, and after an economic crisis. One of the most important lessons to be learned from the Icelandic crisis is to be wary of the restricted capacity of small economies to engage in the global international economy without shelter. Four. When it comes to Iceland's foreign policy alignment with the European Union, the EU simply invites Iceland to take part in its foreign policy declarations without prior, prior uh, dialogue, pr without, with, without prior political dialogue. Our case study presented in the chapter on Iceland's consideration to withdraw, withdraw its support from the US-EU-led sanction against Russia indicate that Iceland's foreign policy choices are restricted by its alliance preferences. Five. Proportionally, more Icelanders have migrated abroad when compared with migration of citizens from most other European countries. We, we, we rarely speak about this here in Iceland. In 2014, for instance, nearly 12% of Icelanders lived abroad compared with 10% of Lithuanians, just over 7% of Swiss, and 6% of Greeks. The small Icelandic society is like many other small communities in that they are in, in a danger of a brain drain. Finally, to summarize, Iceland engagement with the European project provides a mixed picture in terms of a shelter theory. Membership of EFTA, the EEA and Schengen are highly beneficial and provide economic and societal shelter as well as some political shelter. However, these positions can be quite costly, or highly costly, I should say. Iceland is not a member of the club, and the EU does not provide the country with essential economic and political shelter during times of need. Thank you. Thank all three of you very much for your presentations. They were excellent. Provide us, provided us with a good basis for the panel discussion that we're going to have right now. Uh, I would like to invite uh, the panelists, Lilia Dogalfrestotter, who's Minister of Education and Culture, to come here, and uh, Auslaug Arna, who is the Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Parliament, and Georg Laurison, Director of the Icelandic Coast Guard, and the three presenters as well. I think you should be part of this. Uh, what we have done is that we've basically prepared this in advance and we've asked all three of the panelists now joining us to address different topics. So uh, Lilia, if I may ask you to start, uh, what we uh, asked you to uh, comment on is the question, do the Nordic states provide Iceland with shelter? Are you all mic'd up and ready to go? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Go uh, ahead. First of all, I would like to thank everyone, uh, especially. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. Okay. okay. We're trying to be too fast here. I'm sorry. <laughs> this actually provides you with the opportunity of thinking of remarks and questions to pose as soon as we have. Um, Miked everyone up and have gotten everyone ready. I'll wait for the thumbs up from the technician. I think that's the good way to do it, right? 
This is exciting, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Lilia Duck, please go ahead. Thank you very much. First, I would like to thank everyone that participated in producing this book. It's very uh, useful, and I tend to agree with most of the conclusions. So I'll start with, as regards to the Nordic cooperation, and I kind of want to focus on the economic part, because I used to be a deputy director in the governor's office at the time, and I had participated very actively in our Nordic-Baltic cooperation at the IMF level. And we were not sheltered in economic terms as regards to the Nordics. Uh, but there was a complete divide, though, between the Nordics. Um, I'm just going to name a few things which was very disappointing for us during the economic crisis. Uh, first, we had um, bilateral swap arrangements from the Nordics uh, done already in May. But there was a lot of skepticism towards us. We could already feel that because our banks were, of course, unfortunately, growing very fast and they were very uh, concerned about the prospects. And I fully understand that. But they had these swap arrangements done, I think it was in May. But when it came to the crash, Sweden didn't allow us to draw in October. They were the only Nordic country that didn't allow us to draw on a very important part of the swap arrangement that had already been done in May. Um, and when we were preparing for the IMF program, which was also a disappointment, they said very clearly that they wanted a similar uh, program as the Latvians. But there was a clear difference between Latvia and Iceland. We had uh, a floating exchange rate while they were packed. So it was never a possibility that we would have the same economic conditions because they were going through an internal devaluation, while we would take the adjustment through the exchange rate. And it was very clear, and this came from the uh, Minister of Finance, Antes Borg, basically. And it actually goes hand in hand with a book that was just published uh, by Hilmar Thor Hilmarsson uh, called um, called, uh, uh, it, it's actually called, I have it here, <laughs> but what I really like most, it's the economic crisis, it's aftermath uh, in the Nordics and the Baltic countries. And he states a very uh, good, do as we say and not as we do. And it's a quote in Barry Eichengreen, a professor in economics in Berkeley, where basically the, the, the Swedes at that time I know this is a disappointment for some people here in the room, and I, um, especially if, if the Swedish ambassador is here, it's, it's okay. I, I, we have this old document, but I still want to just point this out because it was a disappointment. Uh, the Norwegians had exactly the opposite approach. Exactly. They said, the Icelanders are in a very dire situation. We need to do our utmost to help them. So there was a split between the Nordic group in the approach. Uh, and what I wanted also uh, to add is that uh, this, what I'm saying here right now, uh, goes hand in hand in how the Latvians experience their economic program. Um, they were even interfering with the letter of intent, which is a statement in the IMF program. They wanted harsher conditions in our program than even the IMF. And why did they do it? It completely goes hand in hand in the book that they decided that the interest, their alliance with the UK and the Netherlands was more important than the Nordic Brotherhood, unfortunately. Uh, so if I go uh, uh, in a structured manner, I think culturally, yes, we are in a shelter of the Nordics. They are extremely important as regards to education, our history and you know uh, our participation in the labor market. So definitely, politically, partly, as you just described. Economically, in harsh times, no. But as regards to the labor market and flexibility and migration and imports, uh, yes. Uh, social shelter, without a doubt, the social welfare system. Uh, politically, as regards to the foreign service, yes. 
they have assisted us and we uh, with them. So, a very brief introduction, but I still think it's very important that we go through this the way that the book is doing it, but also with some hard uh, evidence on what basically took place during the economic crisis and the split between the Nordics. Thank you, Lilla. That was quite extensive and I think it leaves us with quite a few questions to, to continue the discussion with. But I would like to move on to the next uh, panelist. Uh, we have asked Auslöv Artna to uh, comment on whether the United States provides Iceland with shelter. Yes, thank you so much for having me and congratulations with this great book. Well, I look forward to reading whole. But yes, I've been asked here to say a few words on the pros and cons of the uh, shelter that the U.S. provided Iceland from its independence in 1944 up to present day. First of all, let me say that without protection and shelter of the United States during the Cold War, Iceland would not be what it is today. I believe that it's evident from this book and many other sources that our strategic position and relationship with the United States allowed us to seek sovereignty of over our waters in the Cod Wars and thereby lay the foundation for the economic growth that we saw in Iceland from the 50s until the present day. And I say Iceland would not be the country it is today if it were not for protection and friend relationship with the United States. And notice that I choose not to use the word friendship because I believe to far paraphrase Henry Kissinger again, like he did here before, that nations do not have permanent friends or enemies, only interests. And in that sense, it's understandable that the US gave, us, gave in to our demands and helped us while we were of strategic importance to them. And might still now that we are again in the position to matter to them. We should not, though, think for one minute that the relationship is any way special. Uh, it is based on common interests of both nations. Uh, we saw that when uh, the Navy base was closed in 2006 and when Iceland was on its knees two years later, then officials and politicians in the US government did not think that our relationship is any way special. And it's in the interest of Iceland to support free trade and international institution that gives us an equal seat to it at the table. And should the United States turn away from that policy? Iceland should not, and I think it will not follow. As the book reveals, uh, Iceland does in many ways punch above its weight because we are members uh, of international institution that give us a voice and we need to support the system. And I think it's also important for Iceland uh, to be a voice of self-determination of small nation, like Bjarni Benson the older put at the core of Icelandic foreign policy as a foreign minister when Iceland joined NATO and the bilateral defense agreement with the United States was signed. But although Iceland might not always follow that policy to the latter, it's still the basis of our demand to be uh, recognized as active uh, participant in the international system with an equal voice and a seat at the table with na nations more powerful in both economic and military so sense. And Iceland did enjoy and use the shelter that the US gave us in the Cold War and we might be able to do so in the future. But Iceland is first and foremost a free and democratic nation that should side with like-minded nations and seek cooperation and maybe shelter if needed. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now on to the European project and particularly Schengen and Georg Larsson. Here you go. Thank you for inviting me and congratulations with this excellent book. Uh, I'm going to go into a little bit uh, more technique, uh, uh, as Walter just touched upon in his uh, briefing. Uh, but uh, 17 years ago, Iceland became a member state of the Schengen area. <clears throat> um, Iceland has made a number of soft security agreements with the EU in relation to its membership of Schengen and uh, participates in a number of 
information sharing mechanism that are highly beneficial for Icelandic law enforcement agencies. Uh, the visa information system, which allows single states to exchange visa data, the single information system, which is uh, used to find information about individuals and entities for the purpose of national security. Uh, the Eurodac system, which is the EU asylum fingerprints database, uh, these are all very important, and uh, it is valuable for Icelandic law enforcement agency to have access to these uh, systems. Uh, two years ago, the National Commissioner of the Icelandic Police uh, released a cost-benefit report on Iceland's participation in the Schengen Agreement. The report claims that there is a general consensus with the Icelandic Police Force that uh, membership in Schengen is important in order to solve international crimes in Iceland and that membership gives the police greater tools to fight uh, terrorism. Um, as Icelandic border guards um, are not obliged to examine identification of each and every person traveling within the single zone, uh, they are able to spend more time and effort on monitoring suspicious travelers. Uh, that has resulted in a stronger border control and increased security for the nation. A single membership has uh, influenced the work of the Icelandic Coast Guard uh, mainly in two ways. Uh, with Frontex, the European Border and Coast Guard Agency on one hand, and through Eurosur Fusion Services uh, uh, on the other. Uh, Eurosur will increase the Coast Guard's maritime surveillance capabilities through better vessel tracking data and increased uh, situational awareness through improved weather and oceanographic forecasting. Uh, the Coast Guard also operates a rescue center for maritime and aeronautical search and rescue uh, at this operational center. And uh, at that center, these uh, systems are frequently used and it maintains what's uh, 24 hours all year round. Uh, for the last eight years, the Icelandic Coast Guard has participated in frontex cooperation uh, with both vessels and aircraft. This cooperation has made the Icelandic Coast Guard more aware of international events and cross-border cooperation. It has given our crews valuable opportunities to exercise. Uh, uh, they have been able to improve their skills in foreign circumstances. Uh, uh, this uh, cooperation has also given Iceland an opportunity to provide a very valuable contribution to the broader European cooperation. Um, just to mention, so far this month, uh, the Coast Guard cruise has uh, already taken part in saving more than 500 migrants in the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, for example, tonight they found uh, 45 migrants in uh, sinking boats, five boats in the Mediterranean, and they were all rescued. Um, this is important contribution of Iceland, and uh, this wouldn't be possible if it weren't for the Schengen cooperation. Um, in my mind, it's pretty clear that the Schengen cooperation provides a great benefit for Icelandic law enforcement agencies. Um, if it weren't for this cooperation, those agencies would not have access to these databases that makes their work more efficient. Uh, the Schengen Agreement has uh, opened doors for employees of those agencies to increase international cooperation. Uh, this experience is and knowledge that uh, has arisen is valuable and I believe very useful for the Icelandic, Icelandic nation. Thank you. Thank you, Georg. Let's give them actually applause for their comments. Before I ask you all to raise your hand if you have a question or comment, I'd like to ask uh, the speakers if you have any uh, 
first reactions to their comments, whether it's Baldur or Sverir or Thorsted that would like to say a few words connecting with whatever has been said already. Not, not really, I would like to hear from the audience. I'm really pleased to hear that all our discussions are making headlines, <laughs> <laughs> providing some new important information. All right, well, let's start it off then with questions from the room. Uh, I already have one over here. Thomas has the microphone, so we will find you all as soon as you signal me. Thank you. Dag. Dr. Damien Dujon. Please say, yes, thank you, your I'm, name. Um, art, I'm working on Arctic security issues. One quick question to Sveria and one quick to Thorstein. I heard about the risk of the American shelter. So even though nothing is perfect, who else would you see to minimize or contain, if you prefer, the rising influence in this country of a non-NATO major global power like China? That's number one. And to Thorstein, a question about the slide with the Nordic Foreign Services. If I remember correctly, you mentioned 61 and 54. Uh, all personnel and data from 2013. I happened to write together with then Danish Rear Liz Vang a publication about the Greenlandic state building process and we had a look, comparison look with Iceland. And I, in, in 2013, I counted and recounted the, the list uh, which was on, on the website of the Foreign Ministry and I counted 263 personnel. So the question was simply, are you talking about the diplomatic personnel? because it sounds more uh, like that. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question here. We'll, we'll actually collect a few before we go over to the panelists, uh, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Anta Marlo. I'm the Ambassador of Canada to Iceland. Thank you so much for this panel. I loved, I haven't read the book, but I loved how you showed how the social shelter, economic, political, and security are all intertwined. I think that's brilliant. And my question, um, to Aslo Arna, but it's open really, and then also I have a point to Georg, is you uh, quoted Kissinger and with respect to no permanent friends and enemies, just interests. So as, you know, Canada is a country, of course, that is very much focused on values. And I was wondering if, uh, going back to Balder's point about how Iceland um, transformed the invasion of, friendly invasion, of course, of UK into a partnership of sorts, you know, if you don't have, if you're not aligned on values but on interest, what happens the day this invasion is not so friendly? Uh, how does it, you know, how do you position yourself in cases like that? I see how some societies can be socially infiltrated, so there's shelter to go abroad, but there's also potentially sh social shelter to protect the society from disinformation and other things. So thinking about the geostrategic, I'm, I'm interested in how you put the values in that discussion and the potential alignment of Iceland in, um, in a crisis that would not just be economic, but actually would touch all the aspects of the relationship. And to Georg, I was wondering, in, in a nation that has, by force and by situation, uh, do not have an army, but a very strong Coast Guard, and where, like maybe in Switzerland or elsewhere, you would have to rely on the population to potentially defend those values, defend those interests, defend this country. How do you feel that readiness uh, of the population would be in case of a situation which would involve Iceland? Because from our perspective, Iceland is not a remote island in the northern Atlantic. It's right at the middle of a lot of important interests in Europe, America, and the Arctic. So that. My question, thank you. Thank you. I think we'll start with those two, unless there is, was there one more that I missed? No. Okay, let's start with those uh, first two questions from Damien and uh, the Canadian ambassador. Over to you, panelists, who wants to take the first shot at this? I can start. Yes. Uh, so the question was about how Iceland can contain China, right? Or protect itself against China if, due to China's increased influence in the Arctic? or. Well, I get the feeling in Iceland that uh, the perception is not that we need to protect against China. We need to just get the best kinds of agreements, uh, continue to get investments, and then on a domestic level, you know, set the appropriate legislation. So I get the feeling perhaps internationally that other countries are more worried about what Iceland is doing and its relations with China rather than Icelanders being worried about China and seeking help from other countries. But, Paul, well, do you have any comments on that? 
Do we need to seek shelter from other powers against China? Because it depends who you talk to. Uh, but you know, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, as we look at it in, in the book, uh, since the crash, Icelandic politicians have been, or Icelandic government has been desperate to find a potential shelter provider. The left-wing government applied for membership of the European Union. Iceland was the first, first European country to make a free trade agreement with, with China. Uh, many politicians continue to look towards the US as a potential shelter provider. Uh, some politicians, ministers today, want to follow Britain around the globe and make free trade agreements. So basically, for, for within the, our shelter framework, we see here Icelandic politicians desperately finding a new shelter provider, which basically we lost at the end of the Cold, Cold War. Lilia, I think you have some comments. Uh, yeah, maybe I would like to address this. I think it's what's taking place, the cooperation that we have with the Chinese these days is, is for instance, on the scientific and Arctic cooperation, which I think can be beneficial for both countries and just the Arctic itself. Because the developments and the climate change that is taking place is of such nature that no country can actually be excluded from this cooperation. So what we're doing right now, which I think is very positive, increasing cooperation on the scientific part. Just what Balter, man, uh, Balter mentioned as regards to that we were desperately seeking uh, shelters everywhere, I would like to uh, address that. <laughs> I think that we have pretty good soft shelters, meaning as regards to the EEA agreement, you know, on free movement of people, capital, uh, education, which we have benefited enormously. So I think that's all good. But as regards to the kind of a hard uh, shelter, of course we have the bilateral defense agreement since 1951. And we are NATO members. So I think from that point of view, as regards to the security, we are pretty well sheltered. But when it comes to like hard economics, when we had the crisis, it's all about hard currency and it's about your balance of payment, what you have as a surplus. You know, it, that's usually a country is just based on its own uh, surplus on the balance of payment, meaning that when we really needed hard currency, it was difficult to get it, but it's difficult for most countries to get it unless, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the ECB provided, of course, lender of last resort, but it was not without a cost. I mean, we see some countries still that are under such harsh conditionality by the ECB, by the Commission, you know, like Greece. But then you have other countries like Ireland that to a certain extent designed their own program. You know, they said, no to some of the conditionality, created their own ownership, and are in a good, in a, in a good shape, they could be yeah, in, a, in a pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. And for you other guys as well, please jump in. China's influence. I think uh, Sverre answered it very, very, very well by saying that uh, there is a tendency in Iceland always to think that we can get very, very good deals by going bilaterally. And this, I think, is partly uh, due to Iceland's history of dealing bilaterally with great powers. Uh, and if you compare that, for example, with the mood in the Nordic countries when it comes to China, they are much more worried about China's growing influence and more worried about sticking together with other like-minded countries uh, in these um, turbulent times. So I think uh, we in Iceland, we sometimes underestimate uh, the dangers of going it alone in a time of power transition. And we perhaps uh, also underestimate the importance of the protection that we can get from um, from aligning ourselves more closely with other countries like the Nordic countries when it comes to dealing with something completely new and, and unpredictable, such as China's rise today. And this ties into what we're uh, uh, talking about, uh, societal shelter, and not just something that happens uh, in the aftermath of an economic crisis, but what kind of another societal shelter can we address? Any comments on you for that? I'm sorry, I didn't get the last part. No, just that uh, for the societal shelter uh, that uh, we are talking about and addressing, and not just looking at, at it from the uh, perspective of an economic crisis happening, if something else happens that, that mm. is quite detrimental. Um, could you then comment on the societal shelter part? Thank you. 
maybe you'd like. Yeah, basically, this mm -hmm. what it's said is that this access <coughs> to uh, the Nordic states mm -hmm. and to the the to the European or to other European states, mm -hmm. basically, if we get through the Nordic Council and the EEA, is basically a must, especially for a small community. I mean, the the the, the Brits can probably go go do it on their own, probably. <laughs> Uh, but Not we, always. <laughs> uh, there seems to be some difficulties. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's impossible for a small community uh, to flourish without access to not only to a large market, to, uh, to a uh, yeah, greater human capital, if I can, I can say so. But, uh, yeah, I think Austro got a question. Yes, please, Austro, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Just one thing about the Arctic, of course, Iceland is going to be chairing the Arctic Council from 2019 to 2021, where all the Arctic countries, as well as Russia, Canada and the United States, sit around the table and actually get, a, get on along quite well, uh, I must say. And it's a unique forum where our interest covers and the key words remain cooperation and sustainability. And here we need the United States and everyone else to get involved. And there are some common values. So, uh, and uh, because uh, you asked about especially maybe the values, uh, um, I think we will always make a decision on our own interest. And I'm sure values is a part of that decision and will always be. Um, and what maybe I meant was just that we need to face the fact that countries like the United States uh, like any other superpower, will always make their decision based on their own agenda. And I think that's just a fact how I see uh, their decisions, uh, at least uh, if I look, we just need to look, like I said before, 10 years back to see uh, an example of how we were left hanging during the financial crisis, just like most of our friendly nations in Europe. So it was not only the US. So it seems like we're not too happy with the cooperation going on when economic crisis <laughs> occurs. <laughs> that seems to be the consent here. Uh, we are open for further questions and comments. Yes, Georg, please, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so we need uh, a cooperation, we need shelter when it comes to crisis situation. Um, we are we are fully civilian. There is no military, uh, but uh, when it comes to crisis situation, the Iceland nation is more like uh, more like one family. Uh, so we have uh, excellent cooperation, of course, with uh, the voluntary rescue organisation, the police, and every everyone able to do something are willing to to take part. Um, seeking shelter in, in, at our neighbours. Uh, then we, I would first like to mention um, our Nordic friends, especially Denmark and Norway. Um, we are very much dependent on their assistance, their help. Their, uh, they are frequent visitors here in Iceland. They are operating both east and west of Iceland. And that is a very important shelter for us, and that we are very much dependent on. Thank you. Palter, yes? I just want to mention in relation to this. One of the things that I learned when uh, conducting this research, or found out, which I didn't really know, how closely many, if not most, Icelandic uh, public institutions cooperate closely with, our, with their sister organizations in the Nordic states. And of course, sometimes with uh, other European instit institutes. And basically, as, as, as we see it, they are seeking advice and expertise by these much larger organizations. And uh, we, we have a good uh, section on, for example, the cooperation between the Icelandic Coast Guard and the sister organizations in Norway, Norway and, and Denmark, extensive collabor co collaboration. And uh, basically imp impressive to see how closely, how closely they work together. And, and yeah, again, provide Iceland with essential uh, shelter, uh, both on a day-to-day -day basis and in case of a possible crisis event. <laughs> 
Lila, yes. Yeah, can I follow up on this? Because I think it's a very good point, and it was also something that Dustin Christen, Christensen mentioned, is that, for instance, in the IMF cooperation, we share one executive director at the executive board. So you can just imagine um, how difficult it was when we had this uh, conflict within the Nordic group as regards to our loan facility and how the program was designed. And just to mention how closely this cooperation is, for instance, we have joint uh, views on every matter that we have in the executive board, whether it's monetary, like uh, capital flow management tools, uh, loans to Argentina, it's all coordinated within the Nordic Baltic group into one view, and it goes a couple of rounds in the central banks and the Ministry of Finance. And that's why when I started also saying and describing how difficult the Nordic cooperation was, it was even more difficult because of this, how close we had been cooperating and been doing so for decades and decades. So for us, for instance, that we would have higher uh, terms that the interest rates on the loans of the Nordics were higher than in any other program, it still sits in me, to be honest. Because we don't expect that from friends, is that what it is? <laughs> Let me no, also... It's, no, it's <laughs> just like you don't want to differentiate between countries yes. that have economic crisis. And we always yeah. need to stand firm on, you know, our conditions and conditionality. Exactly. Let me pose a question to all of you. Do you think that we, Iceland, now has the shelter that it needs? And you can choose whether you want to answer this from a political standpoint or economic or societal. You, let's start with Thorsted. We'll start on that end. Start with me. Um, yes, well, I, I think I will keep on uh, talking about the societal shelter then, and I will say that yes. I think Iceland enjoys extensive societal shelter, especially from the Nordic states, but also from Europe more generally, and to some extent to, from the United States. Um, I think um, the main danger here is that we in Iceland, we take this completely for granted. And in, our, in looking forward, I think it's important that we, um, that we think very carefully about why we have such privileged and good access to other societies that contribute to our well-being, and be careful to maintain those relations uh, in a good way. Thank you. And on to Georg. Yes, in uh, my small safety and security world, uh, there's always a need for improvement. Um, we have um, excellent cooperation with our neighboring countries. Um, uh, we have also a very good cooperation with the um, US. Um, that's uh, probably more military related, but also comes to comes to security issues in Iceland. Uh, the Canadians, they have plans of operating frigate north of Iceland. That's, uh, that's a very important contribution to our safety and security. Um, the Iceland Coast Guard is uh, uh, taking over the chair of uh, Arctic uh, Coast Guard Forum <coughs> in uh, March next year. Uh, it uh, goes parallel with the with the chair of, uh, of uh, the Arctic Council. And uh, uh, the aim is to improve safety and security in the Nordic, in the Arctic area. And uh, that's something we look very much forward to. Thank you, Sverre. OK, so does Iceland get sufficient shelter today? Uh, well, I think it's worthwhile to keep in mind that the shelter that we got during the Cold War was very unique. It's not the kind of shelter that many states can expect today, and I don't think Iceland will ever get that kind of comprehensive assistance from a great power again. Uh, but Iceland is fairly secure, and I think Iceland might get like a shelter from a large number of diverse sources. There's perhaps a totality of shelter in the modern international system, so... And it's easy for a small state like Iceland to prosper and to survive. So in the modern international system, it's you know, peaceful. The, the international economy is as liberal as it has ever been. So it's not going to be difficult for Iceland to find markets and to trade. Uh, the international system is as institutionalized as it, ever, uh, is it, as it has ever been. Uh, so uh, I think the situation is fairly good for Iceland. 
but Iceland lacks, of course, the kind of uh, patron that it had during the Cold War. Uh, and I don't think we should expect that to happen again uh, unless something In spite changes. of the increased importance, strategic importance now in the North Atlantic? Uh, well, I don't think Iceland is as strategically important as it was before. Uh, and I don't imagine that changing in the medium term, perhaps in the long term. So, Ausle Arna. Yes, thank you. Uh, when we look to security and defense uh, shelter, I don't think we need to have any reason to doubt that the US will stand, always stand up to the current defense agreement. And I can't see the scenario uh, where the US would leave us hanging if it comes to military action in or around Iceland, um, regardless of who is the current commander in chief. Uh, and the US has much interest in the North Atlantic, maybe not as they had during the Cold War when we were looked as an unsinkable flight carrier. Uh, but I think in that matter, the, the defense shelter we stand quite well. Uh, it's uh, a different issue with politically or diplomatic manner or shelter uh, like we have seen and um, I think I will not comment further on that. I think it's, yeah. Thank you. Lilia? Uh, I think I understand that I think uh, we still are of strategic importance and we will be so I think for years and decades to come. And I think there is a remark made by Winston Churchill in 1940 when he said, whoever possesses Iceland holds a pistol against UK, US and Canada. And the first action he took as a prime minister, I think it was on May 9th, was basically, you know, to go and take over Iceland because of this fact. And due to the developments in the Arctic, I think that our importance as from a strategic point of view is going to grow. And we see that with the interest of cooperation, whether it's on the Arctic Council, uh, scientific matters or what it is, because a lot of information can be gathered in Iceland that cannot necessarily be gathered elsewhere because of our uh, strategic or geographic importance and the, the climate change. So I think that I, I, I want to disagree with Sverre on, on that front. We, we will continue to have this uh, position, even though it has changed somewhat as the end of the Cold War. But are we sheltered? I think uh, uh, from a, a social point of view, yes. Uh, from a political point of view, yes. Uh, economically, to a certain extent. If we run into serious difficulties, uh, we, need to be, we need to rely on our own balance of payment, and then I mean surpluses, and we need to have our fiscal position uh, very well placed and owe little debt in order to be always prepared. Uh, yes, and yes, and, and from a security and defense point of view, I think that we are, are sheltered both due to our NATO membership and as regards to the bilateral defense agreement that is still uh, go, you know, uh, we just renewed it actually uh, uh, to a certain extent in 2016. Thank you. And Baldur? Uh, as has been said before, and as I hope we show in the book, we have a solid, comprehensive societal shelter provided by the Nordic states and the e our membership of the European Economic Area. When it come to, comes to the uh, political shelter, yes, we have military shelter provided by membership of NATO and uh, by the United States. However, when it comes to diplomatic shelter, which is part of the political shelter, I'm not so sure. If our interests uh, are the same as the Nordic states of the US, yes, they will support us or, or collective action. However, if our interest classes Plus, with the other Nordic states, they are not going to stand by our side. And the same is with the United States. And this is a problem. I would say this, 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 this is a problem. And this can relate to so many issues. Let's say just our whaling policy or uh, 
or Arctic affairs, or whatever it is, uh, if, if, we, if we face a crisis situation, we, we, we need to have, as we see it, someone that we can call on and rely on that comes to our aid and support. And on economic shelter, I, as well as I hope we show in the book, we don't think it's enough to buffer from within. It's fine to have good economic policies and good governance. And that's a must for any state, small and large. But from our point of view, that's not enough for a small community. Because of the fluctuating small market, relying much more on import and export than larger markets, be much more vulnerable to international financial economic crisis. So they have to have someone, they have to have a red line or red phone, and someone they can call on and get aid from in an economic crisis situation. And this is basically what we lack, and this is an issue which we not, from my point of view, we not managed to, to solve 10 years after the economic crash in 2008. I almost feel the need on, to call on the foreign ambassadors here, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question back there. Ragnar, Thank you. Uh, my name is Ragnar Thororsson with the Ministry for Foreign Affairs uh, here in Iceland. I wanted to uh, connect into the last point, um, and uh, this is more of a, a thought, and maybe it would be interesting to hear the reflections of the politicians here. Uh, do you think that when it comes to diplomatic shelter, that Iceland needs to do more uh, in creating these mini shelters with regional players like Canada and North America, France, uh, Germany, and Europe, uh, India and South Asia, and Japan in, in East Asia? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's start with Auslaug or Lilia. Yeah. Go ahead, Lilia. Otherwise, increase the staff of the Foreign Service. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that we can always do a better job on that front, and I think that we, you know, alliances for a small state, as just Baldur mentioned, is extremely important, and uh, we have uh, also a lot to offer us uh, on that front, both because, you know, of our a uh, strategic position. But, so I think that we should fo be forward looking. But we also, which I just want to mention, it's also of critical importance that, that, that we, if we are a member of a club, that club needs to respect where the origin of our export revenue, revenue comes from. You don't want to be completely dependent on aid or something like that. We need to be selfish, you know, we need, we rely on international trade, but it's very important that, uh, that, th that everyone respects the resources, and we are still a resource-based economy as regards to export revenue, and we have to realize that. Ausler, yeah, I agree, and I think we can do better, but still we are doing a great job on many areas around the world, and. Uh, I don't think always the answer is more people uh, everywhere uh, in the system, but uh, still I think there is a great opportunity for us to look at where we can do better. And in case of uh, the, the last r remarks from Baldur, that uh, there are many areas that we can uh, look at, especially after the crisis, uh, and uh, how we want to see it in the future. And, uh, how kind of relations we want to have with those countries you mentioned. Yes, Baldur. Mm. Of course, it's important to keep close relations with these new emerging markets and important world actors. However, if you force me to prioritize, I would say strengthen the collaboration with our closest friends. And for example, we could try to strengthen Nordic cooperation. And I think there is an opening there at the moment to work closer politically uh, on, uh, on the diplomatic front and the security front. So work closer with the Nordic state, strengthen uh, Nordic cooperation, work closer with European powers. And I'm not necessarily talking about EU membership, not at all. We could, for example, work, I think, somewhat if not much closer with Germany and France and Canada as well. These are our neighbors that I, I think we should strengthen our relationship with. There's a lot, and there is a lot to do there. And the other three panelists, would you like to add something to this? 
No, they're all done out. Okay, if there are no further comments or questions, I would like to thank the panelists and please join me in doing so. And now it is my honor to present to you to the Prime, the Prime Minister of Iceland. She's going to give a closing address discussing the position of Iceland in the international system. Katrin Jakobsdóttir, go ahead. I'll get the guests there, dear guests. Um, I have not been here the whole time, but I have read the book. I don't know about you guys, but I read the book this weekend. So that's my excuse for being here, delivering these closing remarks. And first, I just would like to congratulate Baldur and his colleagues on this publication, because I think it is so important for a small state like Iceland to have scholars who are focusing on international affairs, international relations, not least in these times where everything we knew about international relations is changing day by day. So congratulations. I think it's a very important thought that we are discussing here about shelters and small states. And I agree with the conclusion that small states are heavily dependent upon both international and bilateral collaboration. And it is also the key element in building up peaceful and prosperous societies, as well as protecting and promoting freedom and human rights. Many of the civil liberties we enjoy today are actually the result and product of international treaties and obligations. And if we think about the situation today, I sometimes doubt that we could have reached as progressive international legislation as the generations before us did. When we think about the political climate today, I could mention the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is still today a fundamental instrument in the protection of human rights across the world. Would we be able to deliver that product today? It's an, it's an imposing question, really. If I take more recent example, the Council of Europe's Istanbul Convention on Ending Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence is a major tool in the protection and promotion of women's rights in Europe and beyond. And Iceland was one of the first countries to sign the Istanbul Convention, which was the precondition for its entry into force. And through this and the recent ratification, Iceland has, in cooperation with other states, put pressure on others to adapt the standards and protections offered by the Convention. And even though no country, and Iceland definitely included, has managed to achieve full equality between men and women, Iceland's progress in this field could serve as a prescription, which can be useful for other states and civil society organizations. And similarly, Iceland on a daily basis refers to other countries in its policy making. Indeed, through international collaboration on gender, Iceland has managed to communicate one of its important values, equality. And values matter in international collaboration. And I think that's one of the lessons learned from this book, that when we are talking about international collaboration, we need to think about values. Um, Iceland has historically projected itself as a peaceful country, associated itself with non-violent settlements of international disputes, and Iceland is also advocating a collective approach on climate change, which I see maybe as the most pressing issue today, globally, in today's politics, together with the need to reduce social inequalities in the world. As you were talking about here in this panel discussion, and as you talk about in the book, small states like Iceland need many allies in the world, but also a diverse group of allies. This does not mean that Iceland's policy should be based on the notion that all states should be approached or treated equally. We live in a world that has become increasingly authoritarian, where new undemocratic political formations, financial crisis, social and ethnic exclusion, and information wars have undermined democratic processes. This means that friends can become enemies far too quickly. And that is why values matter, especially for small states and our relationship with other countries should be guided by them. 
I would uh, like to say, when we are thinking about us as a small state, we need to be very much aware of the interests of great powers and powerful economic interests can take precedence over the interests of the less powerful. And that can be difficult when you're a small state. We should also be mindful of the fact that small states can have a leverage which reduces dependency on larger states or collectivities and which can be used to promote their own foreign policy agenda. And as Balter was saying, if we think about Nordic cooperation, for example, we have seen that when the Nordic countries collaborate, collaborate, they actually, you could say that they weigh a lot more than the putting just their independent weight together. They actually can push above their weight. The Nordic countries are our key allies in the world, and we have always placed much emphasis on the Nordic cooperation, Nordic Council, and other venues. And I think, as I said, we have a stronger voice collectively than each of on our own. The extent of Nordic collaboration has influenced Iceland in multiple ways, both our identity and the ways in which we are perceived in the world order. And this has been beneficial in a myriad of ways, allowing this group of states to push for progressive policies, as was the case in the 60s and the 70s when the Nordics actually took the lead in both environmental issues and issues of disarmament. And today, where the Nordic countries are a global leader on women's rights, peace and social justice. But I could mention other forums international collaboration within the United Nations, where Iceland actually decided to take that place in the Human Rights Council, which means that discussions on foreign policy in Iceland will change. And I hope they will change for good. Not for good, for better. Sorry, when you're not speaking your native language and all that. And what, I'm, what do I mean by that? I do think, I do hope that discussion about foreign affairs will become more mature, more developed in Iceland, because being there in the Human Rights Council means that we have to often take a more balanced view on issues, that we have to consider our stand very carefully, and I think it might prove very good for us as a society to take that responsibility, not just to follow the lead of others, but take that responsibility individually as a society. And I hope it will also be good for the discussion about foreign politics in Iceland. I could mention also the Council of Europe, uh, which can actually prove an important uh, forum for Iceland. And I also agree with the fact that's mentioned in the book, that we could actually nurture our relations with individual states within the EU better. And I hope I will make Baldur glad when I tell him that my next meetings are in France and Germany. <laughs> so, so I'm following your conclusions here. <laughs> we should not hesitate to prioritize bilateral relationship when needed, because if you've learned something from the financial crisis is the fact that we should never put our eggs in the same basket. Of course, as our panelists were talking about, when it comes to shelter, we are very close to the idea of security. And we have a national security policy which the parliament actually passed in 2016. And there you have all the pillars. You have the uh, defense mechanism with the US, you have the membership of NATO, but you have also that broad conception of security, which I think is the basis for this book, which is to think about different types of shelter, political, economical, societal, security shelters. And that's really, could I say mirrors the, the thought that the parliament was trying to pass on through that national security policy and looking at security from a broader point of view than we have maybe done in the last decades. And I think that's also a very important step for Iceland because we may not always agree on foreign policy, but all politicians have to bear in mind that, what, that one of their primary obligations is to ensure the security of all their citizens. That's just part of running an independent state. As for Iceland's role internationally, I firmly believe that we should continue to working towards peaceful solutions to conflicts, advocating, advocating for equality, human rights, and sustainability, internationalism, and universal rights, 
are under threat across the world, and small states can actually be key players in promoting international law and values instead of raw power interests. Because for us, that really matters, that we follow, uh, that we follow the international law and, and ensure that all people are granted their rights. And for this reason, I want to emphasize here that while small states need to rely on collaboration with other like-minded states and multilateral organizations, they also have an agency. They have their own voice. And we, as a small country, need to use our voice wisely. And I think we have every opportunity of doing so. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, let me also remind you, thank you, Katrin, very much for your address. Let me now also remind you that the book is actually for sale right outside the door. Uh, I think that's it for us now. I would also like to say congratulations, Baltur and Thorsted and Sverrir. Excellent job. It's always a happy day when we have a new publication to celebrate. Thank you all for coming. It was great to see you. Next week we have another event on disarmament, so stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you.